It's not a snowman, but first at five, a fascinating sight and extraordinary smell at the Oregon coast. A massive whale that washed up on the beach at Fort Stevens State Park is attracting visitors and scientists hoping to get a glimpse of the huge creature. Thank you for joining us on this Monday. I'm Laurel Porter. Today, the beach turned into a makeshift laboratory to study the sperm whale. A necropsy to hopefully figure out what happened to the animal is now underway. Environmental reporter Kale Williams reports from the coast. Roughly two dozen scientists have been working all day behind me using large knives and hooks to take samples from the dead sperm whale that washed up on Saturday. They're hoping to figure out how it died and what that can tell us about how it lived. The necropsy is an attempt to kind of determine the cause of death as well as the health of the whale at the time that it died. Matt Burks is with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. He was one of roughly two dozen people taking part in the necropsy of the sperm whale. It washed up at Fort Stevens State Park over the weekend, just down from the shipwreck of the Peter Iredale. And if you thought the shipwreck brought out the crowds, well, you haven't seen a giant dead whale on the beach. Sperm whales don't usually wash up during the winter and aren't super common on the Oregon coast. About half the whales that wash up on Oregon's coast are grays, and another 13% are humpbacks. That's according to a federal database. Researchers were busy almost all day Monday taking blood samples, along with samples from the lungs and heart. Those will help determine how the whale died. While it did have a sizable gash on its side, Burke said it would take time to figure out if the whale was hit by a ship or if it got tangled in fishing gear. While the whale's necropsy was not for the faint of stomach, the procedure offered a rare educational opportunity. Anand Gawarakar brought his young son Pranav from Portland so they could get a look at the action. I've seen it in, the, in books, I read about it in books, and uh, I thought this was a great opportunity for him to see the creature. It's so big and, and I didn't get to see a whale and I didn't see, get to see it inside. Burke said while the whale's death was sad, the animal didn't die in vain. Today has been a really good opportunity to teach people about sperm whales, about their populations, and it's kind of turned into a living classroom out here. Now, Burks told me that it would be up to the State Parks Department to figure out what to do with the whale. But given that it's 40 feet long and weighs roughly 20 tons, they'll probably let it decompose where it sits. Upwind from the whale, I'm Kale Williams, KGW News. Good idea, Kale. There is traffic trouble on roads in a couple of spots today following two crashes, both involving semi-trucks. First, a semi rolled over on I-5 North, just south of Wilsonville. The crash and resulting detours created long delays and a big backup. All northbound lanes were closed for hours. ODOT says one lane is still closed. No word yet on what caused the crash or if anyone was hurt. And on Interstate 84 in the Gorge, a semi-crash near Multnomah Falls. One lane heading west and one lane heading east were both closed but have since reopened. We're still working to learn more about what happened. A bill aimed at lowering the legal limit for driving under the influence of alcohol is under consideration in Washington. If passed, the bill would lower the legal limit from 0 .08 to 0.05. Let's bring in Mike Benner. Mike, the feds have been pushing for something like this for quite some time. Yeah, that's right, Laurel. Back in uh, 2013, the National Transportation Safety Board started encouraging states to lower the legal limit. Utah obliged about four years ago, and now Washington is considering it. Today, people had a chance to weigh in at a public hearing. February 2018, SR-14 in Vancouver. A suspected drunk driver crashes, killing himself and two others. If anybody understands the magnitude of something like this, it's Linda Thompson. In the late 80s, she lost her own son, just three years old at the time, to a drunk driver. In the courtroom at sentencing, a woman told our family we knew he was going to kill somebody sooner or later. Sorry about that. It was your family. That encounter, the experience of losing a child, is why Thompson's in favor of stricter laws when it comes to drinking and driving. We need to be able to count on public policy that will save lives and not promote alcohol as, as a product over lives. On Monday, Thompson was one of many who testified at a public hearing on Senate Bill 5002. If passed, it would lower the legal blood alcohol level from 0.08 to 0.05. It is very clear to me that drunk driving is impacting the safety of our communities, and it is time that we do something. Senator John Lovick, the bill's prime sponsor, acknowledges the more than 600 people who died on Washington roads as recently as 2021. 
Many of the crashes were a result of driver impairment. The purpose of this DUI law is not so law enforcement can go out and make more arrests. The purpose of this DUI law is to change driver behavior and therefore save lives. At least that's been the case in Utah, where the legal limit was lowered to .05 in 2019. Since then, the number of fatal crashes in Utah has dropped by more than 19 percent, and the number of people killed has decreased by more than 18 percent. Washington wineries take the privilege given to them to serve their wine in their taste rooms very seriously. Josh McDonald is the executive director of the Washington Wine Institute. He's in opposition of Senate Bill 5002. He fears it'll negatively impact wineries. Without the ability to offer on-premise tasting of our product to our customers, including local and state tourists, um, discovering our wine for the first time sometimes, uh, many times, and choosing, it, choosing our wine over other states' and other countries' wine, Washington wineries will not be able to compete. Among those who disagree is Linda Thompson. This is legislation that will save lives. We have the systems in place. We know that it is not going to affect our, our tourist industry. All right, before this bill can become law, it's got to get out of both the Senate and the House. Then Governor Inslee has to sign off on it. So still a ways to go and we'll, of course, stay on top of it. Laurel. Thank you, Mike. In Oregon, the 2023 legislative session will get underway tomorrow. One of the biggest changes will be the state's new governor, Tina Kotek, who was sworn in last week. The assembly will also be fully in person this year. The Oregon Constitution gives the session a deadline of June 25th to wrap up, though an early finish is allowed. Oregon Representative Suzanne Bonamici and her husband, Judge Simon, are recovering after a car hit them on Friday night in northwest Portland. Police say they were in a crosswalk when the car knocked them down at a low speed. Representative Bonamici was treated for a concussion and a cut. Her husband had minor injuries. Bonamici tweeted they are recovering at home, and she thanks supporters for all their well wishes. In the murders of four University of Idaho students, it could be months before we learn new details about the killings. Suspect Brian Koberger isn't due back in court until June. But we are learning about what a potential defense could look like. Attorneys are already pointing out that Koberger won't be able to use an insanity plea. Law experts say Idaho is one of only a few states that does not accept a mental condition as a defense. And I'm expecting a really multi-layered defense that blames someone else, either another person or, get ready for it, an alter ego. Koberger maintains his innocence. He's accused of stabbing and killing the four students at a home near campus back in November. Now to a KGW investigation. For many low-income families, food stamps, or SNAP benefits, are a lifeline. But lately, some recipients have seen those benefits disappear. Fraudsters are using card skimming to steal SNAP benefits. Investigative reporter Kylie Boshi started looking into this issue after getting several calls and emails about it. Kyle? Laurel, there's actually a pretty simple solution here. But before we get to that, let me explain the problem a little bit. Like thousands of other Oregonians, Trisha Collins relies on food stamp benefits and cash assistance. It's critical to help support her 10-year-old son. On the first of each month, the Oregon Department of Human Services loads Trisha's EBT card or Oregon Trail card with benefits. So in the morning of December 1st, Trisha went to the ATM expecting to find a month's worth of benefits on her Oregon Trail card. But instead, the money was gone. Someone had withdrawn $420 from an ATM at a 7-Eleven store in Edgewood, Washington, near Tacoma. Trisha warned the state agency that her account had been compromised. But it happened again, the very same thing a month later. And it blew my mind that nobody on the fraud department side did anything. No, no flags, no, no nothing. Like if it was like if it was a Visa or MasterCard or something else or uh, the transactions were done in another state, you would get a call like immediately. And she's not alone. Over the past several months, the USDA, which oversees food assistance along with several states, have warned about fraud tied to EBT accounts. Crooks often skim EBT cards by secretly installing a device on ATM readers, which brings us to the solution here. By upgrading EBT cards with smart chip technology, Oregon DHS could make them more difficult and expensive for fraudsters to skim. Currently, Oregon still uses the old-fashioned cards with a magnetic stripe and no chip. 
So why don't they make this simple change? Well, Oregon DHS says it's too expensive. We'll have a lot more on this coming up at 6 on the story. You'll definitely want to see our, our full investigation then. We look forward to it. Thank you, Kyle. A year after a record number of deadly shootings in Portland, we now unfortunately have the first one of 2023. It happened this afternoon at a 76 gas station on Northeast 102nd Avenue in Gleason. Portland police tell us the victim was taken to the hospital, but he later died from his injuries. We don't know yet what led up to the shooting and we don't have any information about a suspect. Police say they'll release the name of the victim once the family is notified.